The widespread cultural acceptance of LGBTQ identities presents an immense challenge to contemporary Christianity. The debate is excessively broad. Questions of law, morality, tradition, culture, and scriptural exegesis all overlap. Volumes of books can and have been penned on this very controversial issue. This video essay will deal with only one small corner of this debate, but a very important corner because it's a common point of contention which often confounds well-meaning but otherwise unprepared Christians attempting to defend the traditional Christian condemnation of homosexual or sexually deviant behavior. It often happens that a supporter of these deviant identities, when confronted with the many biblical injunctions against homosexuality and sexual perversion in the Old Testament, will respond by saying something in the vein of, well, the, the Old Testament says we ought not to eat shellfish, and we still do that. You can't pick and choose which passages from the Old Testament you're going to obey. I'm sure you've all heard some variation of this argument. We could formulate the argument syllogistically thus. The Old Testament says we cannot do X or Y, but we still do X, therefore we can still do Y. The argument has many variations, but the crux of it is that an assertion that some activity is prohibited in the Bible is resolved by pointing out other prohibitions in the Bible that are no longer observed by Christians. The purpose of this argument is to weaken the Christian's conviction concerning the authority of the biblical prohibition against sexual deviancy. It also implies that Christianity is selective in how the scriptures are interpreted, that what is and is not binding is conditioned by culture. This is at the heart of the shellfish argument. Now, the shellfish argument seems strong, but only to those who do not understand the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. Unfortunately, people without this biblical grounding can be taken in by the shellfish argument. I see it all the time. And it's frequently trumpeted by pro-homosexual Christians as an argument in favor of a broader tolerance for alternative sexualities within Christianity itself. Now, there's lots of examples of how this argument is furnished, but just to take one example, I'll use the Protestant musician Jennifer Knapp, who, despite claiming to be a practicing Christian, is also an active lesbian in a same-sex relationship. In an interview about reconciling her homosexual lifestyle with scripture, Knapp brought up the Old Testament prohibition against shellfish. She said, quote, The Bible has literally saved my life. I find myself between a rock and a hard place, between the conservative evangelical who uses what most people refer to as the clobber verses to refer to this loving relationship as an abomination, while they're eating shellfish and wearing clothes of five different fabrics and various other scriptures we could argue about, end quote. Notice that when shellfish is brought up in the context of a discussion of Old Testament condemnations of homosexual behavior, the implication is that Christian opponents of same-sex marriage are hypocrites. The Old Testament prohibits homosexual activity, sure, but it also prohibits eating pork and shellfish, and yet we eat pork and shellfish while condemning homosexual behavior. Therefore, we are being hypocritical. If Old Testament prohibitions against eating shellfish can be discarded by modern Christians, so can Old Testament prohibitions against homosexual activity, Knapp infers. The argument is weak on several fronts. For one thing, though it seemingly explains away Old Testament passages on homosexuality, it does not tell us what to do about the New Testament condemnations of homosexual behavior, much less address any of the negative statements from the early church fathers on the issue. It would also be interesting to see how the advocate for alternative sexual lifestyles responds to critiques of homosexuality by Jews and Muslims, both of whom condemn homosexuality and refuse to eat pork and shellfish based on Old Testament prohibitions. But 
the real stupidity of the shellfish argument from a Catholic perspective is in its failure to distinguish between the moral law and the ceremonial law, which is an interpretive key fundamental to understanding the Old Testament. The shellfish argument only makes sense as long as the distinction is not understood. Once it is, however, the coherence of the argument collapses entirely. The Old Testament is full of laws. The rabbis say there are 613 of them, to be precise. Some of these laws are very general and apply to morality and human relations as such, but others are of a ceremonial nature and have to do with the requirements of the Levitical law relating specifically to Old Testament Judaism. The former are called moral laws and the latter are ceremonial or Levitical laws. The moral laws are binding on all men everywhere and at all times without exceptions. Some examples of the moral laws are, thou shalt have no other gods besides me, honor thy mother and father, and do not hate your brother in your heart. The ceremonial or Levitical laws, on the other hand, are binding only on Old Testament Israelites and pertain to the nature of the Old Testament's worship and discipline. Examples of Levitical laws are, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material, and make tassels on the four corners of the cloak you wear. In the text of the Mosaic Law, the moral and ceremonial laws are often commingled. The core of the Mosaic Law is moral, but the morality at the core of the law is surrounded by ceremonial laws. Thus, not every law in the Old Testament is of equal weight or value. Some pertain universally to human nature and morality as such, while others are specific to ancient Israelite worship and discipline and are merely provisional or temporary. It is thus reckless exegesis to assign equal value to every command in the Old Testament indiscriminately. What is the Christian to do then with these laws in the New Testament dispensation? The answer, of course, is that some of them have passed away while some remain in observance, albeit having been uh, elevated by Christ. Since the moral laws have as their subject human nature as such, they are not abolished with the coming of the Lord and the inauguration of the new covenant. In fact, they are elevated and perfected. Our Lord demands stricter adherence to the moral law in the New Testament than in the Old. You have heard that it was said to them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever shall look at a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. The ceremonial laws, on the other hand, have as their subject the worshiper of the old covenant, i.e. pre-Christian Israelites, not human nature as such. Their scope is very limited, and because these laws are directed towards Old Testament Israelites in particular, they necessarily pass away with the ending of the Old Covenant. These laws are transitory by their very nature and reflect the temporary character of the Old Covenant itself. Thus, when the Old Covenant passes away after the coming of Christ, these ceremonial laws no longer have a purpose, and hence are no longer binding on Christians. This was the approach the apostles took at the Council of Jerusalem in the book of Acts when they judged that Gentiles did not have to observe circumcision or a Jewish dietary law because the coming of Christ and the inclusion of the Gentiles had rendered these laws obsolete. The Old Testament prohibition against eating pork and shellfish is one such example. Since this prohibition pertained to the ceremonial law, Christians have always been considered free from observing the dietary aspects of the law of Moses. This is why St. Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a festival day or of a new moon or of the Sabbaths. Colossians 2.16 And that is also why our Lord teaches, Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. This is also why Christians have always eaten pork and shellfish with a clean conscience, despite the Old Testament's prohibitions. It has always been understood that these prohibitions lost their force when the Old Covenant passed away.
Now, the crux of the whole issue is whether the Old Testament prohibitions of homosexual activity and all sexual deviancy belong to the moral or ceremonial law. Because sexuality has to do with the fundamental nature of man and because of the moral dimension of all sexual activity, the Old Testament's prohibitions of homosexuality have always been included in the moral law, and thus they are applicable at all times and places and will never pass away. This is why there is really no contradiction or hypocrisy in Christians condemning uh, alternate sexual behaviors while gleefully eating shellfish and pork. Homosexual acts are always wrong under any circumstance. This is why the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, Tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. The Church Fathers understood the issue this way as well, and hence their writings are replete with unequivocal condemnations of homosexual acts, while simultaneously affirming that Christians are not bound by the Levitical laws regarding dietary restrictions or other ceremonial obligations. Note that the Catechism references sacred tradition. Some Old Testament scholars have argued that this division of Old Testament laws into moral uh, and ceremonial is arbitrary and imposed from outside the text, since the Old Testament itself does not give any indication which laws are ceremonial and which are moral. This is actually not entirely true. If we accept the New Testament's data, there's quite a bit of help uh, for us to sort this out. But by and large, it is Catholic tradition that offers the definitive clarification of these questions, and that's why we can't throw out the tradition and expect to maintain the Christian faith in its integrity without it. Tradition is necessary to rightly interpret the scriptures. In short, the prohibition against shellfish belongs to the ceremonial law, which is not and has never been binding on Christians, while prohibitions on homosexual activity belong to the moral law and are always binding. So Jennifer Knapp and those like her who attempt to blanket uh, believing Christians as hypocrites because of this issue is entirely without merit.